Welcome back, everybody. And I say welcome back because this is a continuation of our previous video, History of Cat Part One, right there. Cats have enjoyed an incredible relationship with humans at times, and an incredibly dangerous relationship with humans at times, mainly because they are so mysterious to us, and because they're so wild, and they're not domesticated the way dogs are. Because of this sort of inscrutable nature, they can be worshipped like they were in the Egyptian times, or they could be burned at the stake as witches, as we know in the Salem witch trials and throughout Europe during the Dark Ages. So that's the up and down that we've been exploring with cats thus far. Are you intrigued? You should be. This isn't like dry history class. This is cats. Let me say it again. This is cats. <laughs> so get excited about it, people. And let's move into our next phase because here we start to imagine what it is for a cat to be a pet. Cats were primarily workers, whether they be on ships or farms or anywhere like that where food supplies are threatened, there were cats there. And there came a point where they started to turn in their relationship with humans and become more, quote unquote, domesticated. Now here's the crazy part. All of that happened in the, the bat of an eyelash in terms of the, the, the overall timeline of cats in this world. And we're talking about the last 200 years or so. 200 years out of millions of years is when cats started becoming family members in a, in a real way. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. You know, one of the keynotes through history when it comes to any type of acceptance of cultural norms is as royalty went and as rulers went, so did the lives of their subjects. Whether it was the pharaohs who helped to deify cats through Egyptian culture, whether it was Pope Gregory IX in the Dark Ages who, with his constant decrees about Satanism, led to the persecution of cats, whether it was the Tsars of Russia or the royal monarchy in England. Subjects always followed suit to the examples that royalty laid out. The rise of Queen Victoria, that was a major milestone in the treatment of not just cats, but all animals. Queen Victoria ascended the throne in 1837. She was always a huge animal lover, especially at the time dogs. But over time, animals just kept flowing into the palace of all different shapes and sizes, including cats and donkeys and birds and all kinds of animals. And she had many children, I think eight children, and those children loved animals as well. And so you see the emergence of animals sitting next to princes and princesses and the queen during, in, in photographs and paintings of the time. So we knew that she was a great animal lover. As a matter of fact, the SPCA in England was formed in 1837, which was the, one of the first organizations dedicated to animal welfare. In 1840, Queen Victoria allowed them the royal patronage, adding the R to RSPCA, and lending that air of legitimacy, which was really needed at the time. That was a really important turning point. I mean, think about it. She says, I love cats. Everybody should love cats. Everyone's like, okay, I'll love cats too. And sort of bring them into their homes, out of the fields, away from just the barns, and allowing them to live with the humans as part of their family. And that sets off a whole big chain of events. And I'll just start, you know, knocking them down here. I mean, we had the first cat show in London, which was 1870. And of course, now we start seeing the breeding of cats and, and breeding for certain looks and certain temperaments, and that's starting to take hold. Then we see the mass manufacturing of cat food in Britain, which then made its way to the U.S. after that. It seems like everything that happened in the favor of cats happened first in, in the U.K. and then came over here, which is fine. You know, I'm cool with that. And, <laughs> and then we had uh, the first cat show in the U.S. Then another important turning point. In 1840, we saw the Queen establish the RSPCA. The ASPCA started in 1866, originally started for the benefit of carriage horses in New York, who still need that protection, by the way. And, oh, that's a whole nother topic. We also saw, as I said, commercial pet food being uh, brought to the U.S., cat shows in the U.S. Also in the 1930s came the rise and acceptance of spaying and neutering of cats and dogs to help control population. Again, it's a kind thing to do. It wasn't just about, oh, they're pests. 
us. It was about, we don't want to make so many that we have to kill them. During World Wars, when meat and fish were rationed, we saw the advent of dry food to feed to cats, and of course that's become one of the biggest industries around. In 1947, Ed Lowe invented cat litter. That is important, folks. Why is that? If you wanted to have your cat in your house, you would have, you know, chimney ash in a box where they would go, or dirt. And then, of course, you had dirty paws tracking stuff all over the house, even though the poop and the pee might be in a box or whatever. But by establishing cat litter, we were really rolling out the red carpet for cats to finally be in our homes in a more full-time basis. Just a quick little reminder, whether we're talking about the timeline of cats through history, uh, the relationship with Queen Victoria, the advent of cat litter, and all stops in between on the cat and human timeline, it's all here in my book, Total Cat Mojo. So check that out as well, because uh, we put a lot of work into this one, and I think that you'll find it really entertaining. And the more urbanized we became, the more cats came with us in those homes. The advent of the suburbs, the high rises, apartment living, and with that, cats were definitively indoors in many, in many places. And yes, they still did their jobs in farms, on, on boats, in, in stores, in bodegas that we see in the US, but they also were becoming family members in a more real way. By the 1970s, and this is especially in the US, but in the 1970s, veterinarians started to really recommend that cats be kept indoors to keep them safe from things like cars and and predators and mean people or whatever could kill them early uh, along with recommending spaying and neutering and most rescue organizations and shelters were mandating spaying and neutering to help protect population growth in this incredibly short span of time cats were becoming family in fact, there was a study done just a few years ago that showed over 80% of families in the U.S. considered their cats family members. I mean, Valoria, my beloved Valoria, who right here in my arm, right here in my heart, she was with me for 26 years. Half of my life she was with me. And that made for one of the most important and deep-seated relationships that I've ever had. And that also marks our, our turning point with cats. Look at how far we've come. And in this little evolutionary drop in the bucket from let's say the 1830s with the rise of Queen Victoria to now, that's nothing folks. Just shy of 200 years between this real sort of concrete bringing cats into homes as pets and now, we're in the middle of the cat renaissance, people. I mean, whether it is purebred cats or whether it is just the cat on the street, whether it is the rise of TNR, trap, neuter, return for feral cats over really the past 30, 40 years, the care that we show community cats and our cats in our homes, bang. Less, I mean, we're talking about this century. It's remarkable when you think about it. And here is one of the most remarkable parts of this, guys. I'm going all the way back to, to pre-Egyptian times, back to the Fertile Crescent. Like I said, watch part one of this whole thing to write this moment that we've never asked our cats for much, you know? We've never said to them, be a certain way. Now, granted, you know, Queen Elizabeth is like, let's bring cats into the home. By the way, cat, poop in this box, you know? Okay, that's asking a lot. By the way, cat, please don't scratch my curtains or my rugs. Well, that didn't work either, you know? But we found ways around that over time. We accept cats for who they are, or we should. And, and one of the things I always tell you is that as opposed to dogs who will gladly jump over the communicative fence and say, hey, what do you want? Cats won't do that. Cats have not been bred to do that. The cat's story is not about jumping over that fence. Our story, with cats is about meeting at the fence. And, and now as we talk about the cat that sits in your lap, who speaks on a daily basis through their DNA to that cat, to, to Catus six million years ago, to the, to the Near Eastern wild cat, that cat, 
We should be appreciating for the mystery they still retain, for the part of us that, that goes, I, I don't know what you're doing or thinking. And you know, I do that sometimes. I, I don't know everything about the cat that's sitting in my lap, and I like it that way. That's the thing that really draws me to them. That defines us. Now, right now, we're at a tipping point in this history. The more we domesticate, the more we bring them in, the more we breed them for those more domestic qualities, the less feral, the more dog. We're right there. I think it would be a shame to lose that wild. I love cats because they deign to be in my lap, because they enjoy being in my presence even though they are somewhat wild. And I hope you do too. And I hope by understanding this history, you more appreciate the wild that is in your home. That sometimes when they don't do what you want them to do, which I know is a lot of the times, it's okay because long ago, we made that deal with a cat that, you know, come along on this journey with me. I won't ask that much of you. You don't have to ask that much of me, but we'll have a good time together. Anyway, that's my history of cats. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, go back and watch part one if you want to know all of the good stuff from the millions of years ago. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, like it if you, if you appreciate our work here. Keep coming back and also put suggestions for new videos in the comments because of course I'd like to hear them. Until next time, my good historical students, all light and all love and all cat mojo to you.